Sai Ram, I offer my most humble pranams at Bhagwan's lotus feet. Dearest Swami, respected elders, dear brothers and sisters. In the beautiful garden of Eden, there was a great variety. All kinds of trees, herbs, shrubs, bushes, grasses. There were roses, there were rhododendrons, daisies, there were pansies, there were lotuses, all kinds of flowers. Similarly, there were mangoes, there were apples, there were grapes, all kinds of fruits. It was possibly the garden with the greatest variety. It had everything conceivable and possible in it. In that same garden, in one corner, was a blade of grass. And this blade of grass was low and depressed and sorrowful. Because it felt totally out of place in this garden of Eden. After all, what am I? Who am I? I am a blade of grass. What is my purpose in this magnificent garden? I am of no use. If I am gone today, will it make any difference to the garden? So, I am absolutely insignificant. These were the thoughts that this blade of grass was entertaining. And one can easily empathize with that blade of grass because very often we are that blade of grass. When we start thinking of the big picture, you know, often the big picture is presented to us in order to humble us. I remember in one lecture, one of our teachers was telling, to just imagine you in Puttaparthi, how small you are compared to Puttaparthi. What is Puttaparthi in Andhra Pradesh? What is Andhra Pradesh in the world? Andhra Pradesh is possibly a little pixel on the globe. But then, what is the globe in the whole solar system? It's a pixel there. But what is the solar system in this galaxy? The solar system becomes a pixel there. And this galaxy in the universe becomes a pixel. So you are a pixel in 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 a pixel. So, so tiny you are, why do you have pride? Why are you so egoistic? What is it that you are boasting about? So therefore, this kind of an example of seeing the big picture, the really big picture, in order to humble oneself is good. But what about a person who is suffering? We all have that feeling very insignificant. What are we after all? You know, that is what happens. Wherever position, that is the reason why we strive to achieve a higher position, a bigger, bigger house possibly, because we just feel that we have to be of some significance in some way, in our own way. For some that significance comes with power, for some it comes with money, for some it comes with intellectual knowledge that is gained through books, for some it comes through spirituality. Yes, you know, spirituality also, if not pursued in the right sense, is just as intoxicating and harmful as any other pursuit. We see it happening, you know, like the other day somebody was telling me about spiritual tourism that is booming in the world today. It's basically tourism painted with the hues of spirituality just to possibly fool your conscience for a while. You're doing everything that you do on any other tour. Live in the most poshest of places, most comfortable of situations. Do everything, but, but I'm visiting a temple actually. So therefore, it is a spiritual thing that I'm doing. This year, you know, I spent 8 lakhs for spirituality. Because I went and stayed in a 5-star hotel near Delhi and then visited Badrinath Kedarnath in air-conditioned vehicles, heater vehicles. That becomes spirituality. Why do people do that? Because that gives them some kind of 
feeling of yes you know something i have done in this life we all want to feel significant and as i said for some it comes in rising in position in your career for some it comes in doing this as i said spiritual tourism so there are many ways but always we are trying to make our lives mean something and in doing so like that little blade of grass in the garden of eden we are constantly on the lookout of people who are doing similar things but have done better than us i have traveled to 20 pilgrimage spots and anybody says wow you have been everywhere eh nat because i know a certain devotee who has done this in india has visited 20 25 pilgrimage spots and done all the customs necessary there you know there is one pradakshina some narmada pradakshina godavari this thing you walk some 1000 kilometers do that devotee has done all that and for any of us it is wow what is it you have done something fantastic but this devotee will tell this is nothing you know that i have not yet done kailash i have not yet done this and why here you know there is one such a place in indonesia i have not gone there oh there is so much because that person is looking up to the ultimate in that particular sphere you go to somebody you know swami used to ask somebody uh, when these alumni would visit on one occasion i remember he was asking an alumnus what is your salary he asked him they say don't ask a woman her age a man his salary but with god there's nothing like that so just ask what is your salary said, swami 1 lakh 1 lakh hmm. then he was looking at some of the students who are employed here telling them see they slog so much for 1 lakh and then the boy said swami per month oh then swami was seeming to be like surprised oh 1 oh, lakh a month i remember at that time swami said increase the salaries of all my boys here you know increase they are not papam they are not getting anything he increased it by i think about 1000 rupees but coming to it it's not that swami could not have given 1 lakh here but there's a reason because swami is giving 1 lakh here all those who seek 1 lakh will come here and swami did not start this place for those who are seeking 1 lakh rupees but that's another story but then at that point in time for anybody who is sitting here and listening to 1 lakh a month that would have seemed like oh my god possibly my annual earning that is wow that's great so you tell him that you know your life must be awesome right 1 lakh a month eh hey, there's nothing no yaar still i need some more if i reach 2 and 1/2 lakh a month it's enough because he is looking at so we don't know actually whether we are a blade of grass or we are a shrub but we feel like a blade of grass because we are constantly looking at trees in whatever sphere we are whether it's finance whether it is relationships whether it is whatever even spirituality you know and and this is their mistaking spirituality people come to me and say oh how blessed you are yes i am blessed but not in the sense you are thinking you are thinking i am blessed because i am speaking such fantastic things but that's just a skill doesn't speak of my spiritual growth in any way there are many others far more spiritually advanced they just don't speak that's it we have this we make this mistake of admiring one aspect in a person and then thinking that because of that aspect everything that that person does is fantastic a dangerous mistake in these days i see sachin tendulkar batting he does it superbly and therefore the toothpaste he uses i will also use what makes sachin tendulkar's batting ability make him into a better person of dental or oral hygiene compared to me i don't know that but just because he bats so superbly anything that he says i will accept if possible he comes in front of me i will shed tears i'll fall at his feet and say oh my god if my god that is the kind of adoration we have but sachin tendulkar is a noble person so he won't possibly exploit it but that leaves us susceptible to exploitation such blind admiration somebody speaks well oh he's speaking upanishad doesn't mean that i understand the upanishads i've just got a skill just like somebody who portrays krishna in a serial doesn't become lord krishna you don't worship him of course the very fact that he is acting such an ennobling role will surely rub off some part of it that's what one of the actors who acted as krishna in the old mahabharata said 
I find it so hard to go back to my old life because how can I do this? I have been Krishna. That is possibly the reason why Swami would make us enact such dramas. And he would not like a negative character. So, usually what is our way of doing dramas? Have a drama in which there is a negative character. That negative character will highlight the positive character. Because simply if you eat sugar, you won't feel it taste sweet enough. Eat a little chilli and then sugar will be like ambrosia. So, in order to highlight the goodness of this person, I'll just bring in one bad guy. That is the concept in any movie also. But Swami was not like that. No villain. In fact, I remember on one occasion, when uh, the drama had a scene from the uh, life of Markandeya. And I hope you know the story of Markandeya where he prays to Lord Shiva and he hugs Lord Shiva and Yamadutas come and put a noose around Markandeya because at the age of 16 he is destined to die. But the noose falls around the linga also along with Markandeya and Shiva appears and tells Yama, Oh you Yama, have you lost your sense? Are you trying to claim the immortal one? Or how dare you throw your noose around, the lo- around your lord? So that's what that boy did. Yama! He said like that. And Swami said, hey, that is Lord Shiva. He doesn't have anger. I mean, you know, it's not that this drama has not been done, but on that one occasion, you know, Swami was saying like that. Swami said, no, should not shout. So finally, in that year's drama, it would be, oh, Yama, how can you do this? I will banish you now. You know, that's how Shiva had to speak. And everybody felt it so funny, but Swami stuck to it. And on the final day, that was how the drama was done. So you see, we feel what I do on the stage is drama. So, so it doesn't matter what I do there because that is not me. I'm just enacting a role. I feel that is how Swami feels about his earthly sojourn itself. This is also a role. I'm doing it for some message. That's it. So during that drama, this is a message I want to give. So I'm going to stick to this. So we all felt, Swami, come on, Swami, how can you, Swami, it looks so funny. How can Shiva come and lovingly speak to Yama? He has to shout at him. Then only the dramatic element. Swami said, no, how can Shiva get angry? He's God. God doesn't know anger. That was the message he wanted to give. And many such times the message he has given is no negative roles in the drama at all. Then Swami, how do we highlight the positive? Bring in ideal. Today, ideal is considered as utopia. It's considered impractical. But Swami would say, no. You have to show the ideal. A good person is there. The good person becomes the villain in the drama. That's what happens. You watch any convocation drama. The person whom we call as villain is a normal person who does things practically. Come on. If somebody is dying there. Don't tell me. No problem. What is there? In the black market, there's medicine available. My mother is dying. Matru Deva Bhava. Hell with that. I'll check out black market, black practices later on. Let me save my mother first. Right? It's practical. No. There's an answer for this also that Swami has given. But when you listen to that answer, you say, Swami, that is not practical. Huh? That is that is ideal. That is the truth. You are saying it's not practical. I say it is practical. That's what Swami would say. And therefore, in Swami's drama, there is no negative at all. There's only good and the hero is ideal. Now, I don't know how I got into this line, but basically, coming back to the topic as to are some lives more purposeful than the others? We always feel like that because whatever we do in our field, we feel some, somebody is more, something is more and we end up like that blade of grass in the Garden of Eden, thinking low of ourselves, small of ourselves, wondering what is the purpose for which I have been made, what is it that I have to do? I am not as lucky, somebody is more lucky. We often do that. I do it to somebody, somebody does it to me. We all have our own hierarchies in different things. Somebody feels I am luckier when it comes to my career. When it comes to family, I feel somebody is luckier than me. When it comes to some other aspect, somebody is luckier. That's what, that's how it is. In fact, you know, being on top of the hierarchy, there was a study that was done, I don't know whether it's by Harvard or one of these Ivy League schools, they had done this study which shows that happiness is directly linked to you being on top of a hierarchy. Some hierarchy. For some, it might be games. You know, I'm, I'm a subordinate at work. My family life sucks. I have nothing good, but I am a champion tennis player. On the tennis court, nobody can touch me. 
and my entire self esteem self concept is built around my tennis i make that the center of my life and therefore i am decently happy because i am at top in something in the same way you may not be anything but but you are the head of a family and everybody in the family listens to what you say that is that is some cause for happiness we are constantly striving to be on top in something because that is what gives us meaning that is what gives us happiness that is what gives us satisfaction and therefore comes this comparison as to is my life as purposeful as somebody else maybe somebody's life is more purposeful than mine for example if i say my life versus gandhi ji's life hey, gandhi ji is more purposeful i am compared to me what is it? let's leave off those standard examples uh if many are familiar with cricket or say, say football maradona great great superstar was his, is his life purposeful if we think like that now many of us say yes some may say no that's based on judging but what about maradona what does he think of his life does he think it's purposeful or not take my own example many people feel my life is very purposeful now what do i feel about my life so therefore when i am judging purpose of life is it depend on what everybody else is thinking or what i am thinking if everybody feels my life is very purposeful but i feel my life is not purposeful or i feel my life is the most purposeful one in the universe and everybody feel that mine is a useless life which which is the one how do we how do we judge whether a life is purposeful or not yeah rama krishna are very easy yeah purposeful but i'm just saying the so called gray areas let's not talk about the roses and the lotuses let's talk about the grass and the shrubs i am reminded of the uh, experience of one certain dimitri i met this mr dimitri a couple of years back just a chance meeting so as always it happens he say he told me that he has been coming to prashanti from several decades i said wow how did you come to parthi first because that's a beautiful story he said i saw swami first not at parthi but at brindavan which year 1980 wow okay how was that what was your incident what was your experience he said in 1978 he had heard of swami and uh, he felt attracted and for some reason he had to come to india and when he had to come to india in 1980 he thought why not visit this sai baba he got to know that swami was in brindavan and in 1978 and uh, 1980 he went to brindavan ashram now dimitri is actually from greece but he had settled in america he was in denver and so he had traveled half the globe now to see swami he came there on his american passport and he says the first time he saw swami that's it he doesn't know what happened with him he just fell in love with swami he decided that i want to serve swami in some way or the other and so in those days when there were hardly many people he would be sitting there second line or third line every day as swami would come walking and as swami comes he is praying he said that he would keep praying swami i want to serve you swami i want to serve you i want to serve you in any way possible i want to serve you i want to serve you not even loudly only barely he can also hear himself because he felt i need not speak loud swami can hear and he would keep praying this he said and a few weeks passed and he began to feel like this blade of grass that we often that we just spoke about what is it what is it that i can do to serve swami who am i after all i have just landed here and i'm simply entertaining some foolish hallucinations all these things were going on within his head he said and as he was thinking like this a vip he says i don't know who it is but it's definitely a vip because he was residing in one of those rooms that were near swami's building near swami's bungalow so it must be some vip otherwise how he would have got accommodation there so he came out and he started calling out mr dimitri from greece is there mr dimitri from greece now he thought this can't be me because i'm dimitri from america my passport is america i have given it as i have registered here with an american passport so this is an amazing coincidence where there's a dimitri from greece possibly so he waited for some time 
nobody was coming out and this person seemed to be feeling a little foolish because he is just standing in public and calling out to dimitri from greece so after a few moments when nobody walked up to him he said that he raised his hand and said i am dimitri from greece that person came straight to him and just gave him a big hug he said ah i found you but sir let me clarify i know greek but i am actually not from greece because i am now settled in us i am from denver but my name is dimitri and by origin i am a greek he said ha that's it that's it you only you only saw me you're saying swami told about me he said yes yes there is one work and uh, when i was wondering how to do it swami said ask dimitri from greece he will do it and i asked swami how do i find dimitri from greece he said you go out he will find you you just call out to him he'll come to you dimitri was almost made into a god by swami you don't worry you go call out he will respond but that's the truth actually everybody why dimitri everybody is god we just had to discover it with him so this is how swami had instructed him and he said okay so I, what is it that swami wants me to do he said swami has received a letter from the greece satisai organization could you translate it for him in english then swami can read it he said wow surely he said yeah do it as soon as possible he said i'll right away sit on it and so dimitri from greece rushes to his room opens that letter sits and translates the whole letter into english as he is writing it he decides that you know let it not be a problem for swami to read so he writes it all in capital letters bold letters so that uh, if handwriting is bad also swami can read it he does the whole thing gets it done he so thrilled and i asked him what was there in the letter he said no some organizational related matters so many questions were there for swami so he did that he took that letter went and gave it back to that person and that person when he saw the letter he first thing he said why did you write it in caps all caps he said no no so that swami can read it and understand easily then dimitri says that that vip smiled and said nice but he also said brother dimitri just remember that it's not any help that you're doing for swami swami knows the minute this letter was being written swami knows what is there i think swami wanted to give you an opportunity to serve him that's all you know exactly what he had been praying it was answered but he forgot that this was the answer to his prayer and so swami made sure that spontaneously and unconsciously this vip reminded him exactly of the prayer see this is the answer to your prayer and then he said yes you know if he knew that i am dimitri i am from greece and i am here and if he knows everything surely yeah so sir, i felt so thrilled and i felt that you know what i i also have a purpose i also have a role to play for my lord i'm just thinking you know we often hear the story of the we say the vanaras are so blessed you know rama's monkey army that fought for rama why because we have heard the story of nala neela hanuman sugriva vali these are only five as reading the ramkatha rasavahini in that it is written that the vanara army consisted of 18 padmas and one padma is supposed to be 10 to the power of 17 so imagine the number of monkeys there that is the huge number and interestingly you know it's only this indian system of numerals that has got names for figures up to the up to 10 to the power 62 for each of it we have got names like how other nomenclature stops at trillion maybe quadrillion whatever it stops there but here it is there to 10 to the power of 64 and one padma is 10 to the power of 17 i think if i'm not wrong so out of those many vanaras actually you know five or six got a chance definitely there would be so many blades of grasses there thinking what is it i don't know if rama even knows me i don't know if rama has ever even seen me but in the future we are all saying, oh, all the vanaras are blessed ah the cows of lord krishna what cows of lord krishna yet some 1500 cows possibly there are some cows which never got his touch it is there it is possible so we just glorify like that and i'm sure a time will come when you say oh sai baba you great you lived in 1980 oh you know swami are i never saw him he never saw me i never touched him never oh no 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 you are you are great you are from swami zira so you see while we we may be sitting here thinking we are worthless yeah somebody is going to come and say wow awesome worth so therefore again coming back to the same question purpose how purposeful our life is is it determined by what others think or what we think 
if we go logically every life has a purpose and now we are thinking whether some life is more purposeful than mine that's what we are thinking so life has a purpose and if we hear to swami listen to what swami says we realize that there's only one purpose in life swami in his discourses would say that every letter that we receive has a to address and a from address that is because in case your to address is wrong and there is no recipient for it the letter is returned back to the from address but swami would say if you don't have a if you don't write a to address or a from address and just put post that letter it will just go to a dead, dead dead letter box it's nothing it will just be destroyed it's of no use swami would say each one of our lives should have either a to address or a for address but the problem is or a from address sorry the problem is swami would say that you neither know the to address nor do you know the from address you don't know where you are headed you don't know where you came from swami would say if you want to know where you are headed what's your purpose of life find out where you came from because where you have come from you have to return there that is the purpose of life that's all it's a cycle if you don't you get into this dead letter box called punarapi jananam punarapi maranam keep getting stuck keep going in the cycle till you find a release and you find the release only with this by finding out your from address or your to address and swami says here any one is enough because both are the same from is same to is also same so that is the only purpose of life whatever else you do you will discover that this is the only purpose of life and many examples swami would give one being the popular example of alexander having conquered the world having great riches he said that when i am dead please bury me in a coffin which has two holes out of which my hands stretch out to show the world that the great alexander who conquered the world leaves the world with nothing and swami would say you seek something permanent how can you get anything permanent from something which is not permanent the entire world is not permanent including swami's physical frame so if you banked all your hopes on swami's physical frame sorry it's not possible because even his physical frame is of the world it came to point out swami would say that you know the mother points out to the child with the finger and says look child that is the moon swami says when the baby is small it starts looking at the finger and when the finger is not there it feels there's no moon who oh, went of moon no moon doesn't need the finger finger is temporary it's just a pointer and during i think 2002 maybe shivratri discourse swami said that is what all your idols are supposed to do your idols are like that finger that point out to the lord they are all pointers indicators all your holy texts all your idols whatever they are right they are correct but they are not permanent you have to forget the finger and then catch on the moon then irrespective of whether your mother is there or not whether the person who is by your side has a hand or not you can still see the moon so the ultimate purpose the only purpose of human life is the same however we may call it we call it enlightenment we call it moksha we call it going back to the source it's basically semantics but the thing is the same so now the question if the purpose of life is only one and every life is engaged in that pursuit in that purpose how can one life be more purposeful than the other because guess what irrespective of what anybody does everybody achieves this purpose only so it is actually ignorance that makes us feel that some life is more purposeful some people are more special some are less special it's not it is not true because everything has the same purpose and today morning when i was listening to the discourse swami exactly started this swami said what is the purpose of life he said in order to understand every sanyasi was initiated into the four mahavakyas because i felt it is so apt so perfect what i'm thinking about and what swami is speaking swami said these four mahavakyas he said pragyanam brahma ayam atma brahma tattvam asi aham brahmasmi these four that's it these four that's all this is the purpose of life pragyanam brahma pragyanam is the ultimate wisdom it says that that wisdom is brahman 
You know, if we look at each of these sentences, they pr it's like coming to the same center, one from the north, one from the south, one from the east, one from the west, that's all. It's coming to the same thing. All the four mean the same thing. When you say knowledge, ultimate knowledge is God, which means the only thing that is not God is ignorance. I remember a beautiful discussion that a couple of teachers had and we were listening to it. It's so fantastic. And they said that, you know, we think that himsa is a sin, untruth is a sin. But for every sin that you state, there is an example of the Lord himself having done that. If you say untruth is a sin, Krishna did this. You know, they were taking only Krishna's example. If you think himsa is a sin, Krishna killed so many. Each of these sins, Krishna has done. But Krishna is not affected by those. And that discussion went on to say that therefore, the only sin is a sin of ignorance. Anything done in ignorance is bound by the law of karma of cause and effect. When it's done in wisdom. That's why whatever Krishna speaks is the truth. Whatever Krishna does is righteousness. What Swami says is truth. What Swami does is dharma. Nothing else. No need to uh, check whether what Swami did is dharmic. Because whatever Swami did is dharmic. Because Swami is doing it in Purna Jnana. He is doing it in Pragnanam. He is not doing it in ignorance. I am doing it in ignorance. When Swami scolds somebody, he is doing it because it is good for the person. Swami has no anger towards that person. But when I scold somebody, I am seething with anger. And that anger will leak over to anybody else who comes in my ambit in the next 10 minutes. So when I am angry, just leave me alone. That's why when we have a favor to ask for the boss, we look some, when he is in a good mood and we go and ask. Because moods can change. When I write my exam, I just pray that my examiner has not got scolded by his wife when he's correcting my exam paper. Because, you know, if that is there, then he will mess around with my exam marks. Moods affect us. Moods don't affect Swami. Because irrespective of how Swami's mood is, if he has to scold you, I have seen that happening. Where Swami's beautiful, broad smile can transform into a rage that can make even lightning look pale. When it comes that he has to do it. Because there, there is no attachment, there is no, there is absolute knowledge. So therefore, Pragyanam Brahma means the only sin in the world is ignorance. I am Atma Brahma, there no, exists nothing else but the same Brahma. I am Atma Brahma, that's how Swami would translate it as. I am Atma Brahma, I am Atma and that Atma is in all and that is Brahman. So anything that is opposite of this is not Brahman. When I feel everyone is different, then that is not Brahman. Anything that is done with that thing in mind is bound by the laws of karma. Because that is not divine. Divine can't be touched by karma. So anything that I can do with the feeling that everyone is same is not bound by karma. And anything that I am doing without that is bound by karma. Then Tattva Masi. You know, this is also so beauty, beautiful. Uh, all this is just an intellectual understanding, but the intellectual understanding itself is so thrilling. Often, you know, it would be said that Tattva Masi means Tat is that, Tvam means you, Asi means are. So you are that. And one, you know, in one discourse, Swami beautifully said that even this is Dvaita. When you say you are that, it means there is you and there is that. There are two separate entities. Swami said it is not Tat, Tvam, Asi. Swami said it is Tattvam Asi. Tattvam means essence. Essence exists. You know, <laughs> I felt in one master stroke, Swami converted a Dvaitic statement into an Advaitic statement. And of course, there's Aham Brahmasmi. Swami would say, in English, you would say that as I am I. I mean, this is the only purpose in life. Whether you come from north, south, east or west, whether you come via Pragyanam Brahma, Ayamatma Brahma, Aham Brahmasmi or Tattvam Asi, the final thing is that it means the same thing. So this is the only purpose of life. And so therefore, theoretically, no life can be more purposeful than any other life. Or no life can be less purposeful than any other life. All lives have the same purpose. And therefore, there is no need to feel proud. There is no need to feel self-condemnation. We feel both. We feel we are superior to some, we are inferior to some. Both are wrong. That's why Swami would say, not only is boasting a sign of ego, self-condemnation is also a sign of ego. Because in both the conditions, we feel somebody is higher or somebody is lower. Feeling both is wrong. 
not only boasting even self condemnation is wrong so it's it's not good to feel like a giant sequoia tree and feel that i am the biggest in the garden that is wrong it's also wrong to feel i am a blade of grass i am nothing i am insignificant i am useless no that's also wrong all are one all have to be same when we don't understand this oneness that is when the question comes you know as i said uh, you know there's the example swami would give of uh, ramakrishna paramahamsa how he sends out brahmananda to get something from the market and when he is coming in the boat they start teasing ramakrishna paramahamsa and brahmananda is shocked to hear people speak so badly about his master he just bears with it comes home and ramakrishna paramahamsa asks him what happened in the boat and when he narrates this he says what is it that you did somebody is scolding your master like that and you don't even tell back one word what you don't have any conviction in your master and next day vivekananda narayan is sent to the market and again the same thing happens as he is returning in the boat these people are speaking rot about ramakrishna paramahamsa narendra gets up keeps his stuff down picks these fellows and throws them out of the boat that's it and those fellows battle for dear life and some don't know whether they are saved or not when he reaches back ramakrishna paramahamsa asks him what happened he says master they are speaking rot about it. i just chuck them out of the boat i showed them what will happen and ramakrishna paramahamsa said all these years you have stayed with me this all you have learnt if you can't control your anger if you can't control one of your senses where will you master everything no they are all like boss tell me what do you want <laughs> you want us to shut up and listen or you want to box that fellow out and in his discourse swami would say that see in the, the there's a there's a thing you know in swami would say in the car tire you should have perfect air more air also will burst the tube less air will make the journey uncomfortable both are problematic for the journey should have the perfect amount of air and so he would say when you go what you'll do what god does is if there's more air he'll remove the air if there's less air he will pump the air you know it 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 looks like some mundane example but it's so beautiful because you know there was this uh, uh question that was asked i had a talk on surrender and i was speaking about surrender and i said you know everything we leave to the lord whatever lord does is best then this person asked me then what is the how do we teach our children self confidence swami says in the spiritual journey the first step is self confidence if you say everything god only does i don't do anything then what do you mean self confidence self confidence is not there i don't do anything what self confidence everything lord only does i am good for nothing then see when swami say see then when we look at that that is when i was thinking about this question and i realized that when we are not able to see the oneness we see these contradictions coming it is the same air that exists outside and in the tire in the same way it is the same thing if we consider our body as the tire the air in the body we call it as self confidence the air outside we call it as faith it is the same air now i'll make it more clear with this little story that swami narrated to the eighth standard children exactly you know it was so beautiful because this person as a balvikas guru was asking me this question of how you will tell the students and here is something that swami did with his seventh class students in the interview room swami began to tell them the story he said there was one little bird one sweet little bird chirping away happily it was sitting on a big branch of a big banyan tree and then swami said it began to rain you know when swami starts building a story oh my god he'll make his eyes big and clouds came and he's building up the story and thunderstorm and the tree began to shake it shook so much and then one lightning struck the entire tree shook and it crashed what happened to the bird swami asked so everybody was saying swami what happened to the bird i mean nothing happened it flew away so i said it flew away because it had two wings it didn't depend on the tree though it sat on the tree it didn't depend on the tree it depended on the wings and swami would say swami then said what are those two wings those two wings are the wings of faith and self confidence so actually you see though it looks like two wings it's not two wings it's just wings when we say a bird has wings we are meaning both 
because a one winged bird can't fly you can't fly with self confidence alone because self confidence alone leads to pride you can't fly with faith alone because faith alone that way leads to this feeling of insignificance you need a perfect balance you need a correct amount of air in the tire the air in the tire is self confidence because swami would say actually see in the tire example the air outside and the air in the tire are the same swami would say it is the same when you say self confidence it is not the confidence you have in your body or mind it is the confidence you have in yourself and yourself is a self with a capital s you have that confidence because you know that it is the lord who is the resident of your heart so therefore faith is confidence in the lord who is everywhere and confidence is the faith in the lord who is within that's all it's the same thing only when we are not able to see the oneness we see it as different so so coming back to again the purpose so one actually the purpose of every life is same so each life is as purposeful as the other the only reason we get into this is because of the comparisons comparisons we make between ourselves and others and you know even if we decide to give up these comparisons many times what happens is it it happens only at a theoretical level it doesn't boil down to the practical one little example for this which i discovered just yesterday yesterday on thursday on asia stream of radio sai every thursday a colleague of mine brother prem and myself we have this afternoon satsang 12:30 to 2 o'clock every thursday so we were discussing the ramayana and in the ramayana particularly the bridge building that is when this aspect hit me as to how sometimes we are so sound in the theory but when it comes to the practical part we forget it so in the bridge building we came to an example of another where a very insignificant thing is done by somebody and the lord appreciates it which is the task that that squirrel did no swami never is interested in quantity even today morning's discourse in which he mentioned these four mahavakyas there also swami is mentioning that god wants only quality so what did the squirrel do the squirrel saw that all the monkeys and bears are building the bridge and they are carrying huge boulders and putting it but what can we do we are squirrels i can't carry even a rock so these squirrels ran to the seashore dip themselves in the ocean ran to the beach roll on the sand sand grain stick to their back and bushy tail and they run and put it into the crevices in the gap on that bridge in between the big rocks little little spaces actually nothing right it doesn't matter for the bridge but they did it and legend goes that rama was so touched he called he picked up that squirrel and he caressed it gently and the stripes on the back of the indian squirrel are supposed to signify the three fingers of rama that ran over its back even to this day that mark of gratitude exists now some say it is a myth swami has clearly told in a discourse that ramayana is not a myth it's not mythology it is history it has happened but even if we leave aside that what a noble thing it is the indian culture is such that they wanted us to think of the lord whatever we look at when you look at a squirrel also think of rama because ah look at those three ah rama did that is how the indian culture has been built so that anything we look at we should think of god that is how you know uh, the thing came about divinizing everything even a vacation is supposed to remind us of god <laughs> we are just changing it to the other way now anyway so this squirrel we were discussing in the satsang and then prem brought up a very interesting thought he said that he got this thought when he was discussing the same squirrel episode with one of his seniors in college and that was every time when different people spoke in bhagwan's presence when we students would speak in swami's presence we would pray that swami first we would narrate the story of the squirrel and then we would say swami let us get the opportunity to be at least like those squirrels in your mission 
What's wrong in this? On the face of it, nothing is wrong. Because we are saying, Swami, let us at least be like the squirrel. But you know, we are, we are being hypocritical because just before when I narrated the story of the squirrel, why did I narrate it? I mean, I'm giving a speech and I'm narrating the story of the squirrel. I'm narrating the story just to say that in the Lord's eye, what Hanuman did and what squirrel did are same. They are the same. There's no difference because Swami doesn't see quantity. He sees only quality. And therefore, squirrel and Hanuman are same. But having narrated that episode, the very next statement I make is, at least let me do like that squirrel. Which means I am saying what squirrel actually did is nothing. I myself said that it is equal to what Hanuman did. So what do you mean by saying at least like the squirrel? Will you say at least like Hanuman let me be? No, I will say oh lord let me be like Hanuman. So if I say squirrel is equal to Hanuman, then I should say Swami let me be like that squirrel. No, Swami at least like that squirrel. Because though I am stressing and using the example to tell everyone that the squirrel, what it did is equal to what Hanuman did. After that, I still feel as ah, squirrel actually, you know, it's nice to tell in speech, but what it did was nothing. That is what I say, this disconnect between theory and practice. We ourselves don't believe what we are speaking. And yesterday when Prem brought this up, I realized, oh my God, yes. Even I have used the squirrel example many times. But every time I still somewhere deep within, I just feel that squirrel is after all a squirrel. And that is why we say, we say also, in our humility, we say we are after all like squirrels working for Swami. Because we feel squirrel is very small. We can't be like Hanuman. You get the disconnect, right? So that is, this is the kind of disconnect that we have when we uh, speak versus when we act. And that is why also, we see some lives being more purposeful than others. There are moments when we get pride and we feel our life is so purposeful, I won't want to exchange it for anybody else. There are times when we feel, oh, my life is worthless. All because of this. The truth is, each life is as purposeful as the other. And the faster we realize it, the better. Let me go back to the story of that little grass, because you know I don't want to leave that incomplete. So that grass is crying, feeling very low. And the gardener comes and says, what happened? What happened, little one? Why are you crying? He says, I am, come on, why did you plant me? Am I of any purpose? Then the gardener sits down, gently pats the grass and says, oh, little Durva. Durva is a kind of grass. I need you, I need you tomorrow. Do you know tomorrow is Ganesh Chaturthi? Yes. And tomorrow I am going to offer you to Ganesha. I am not offering a pomegranate, I am not offering a rose, but I am offering you, your favourite, your Ganesha's favourite. And the Durva cheers up. Just like Mr. Dimitri cheered up, oh wow, I have got a purpose, oh God, I have to do. And Durva was offered to Ganesha. So too, we don't know. The gardener tells Durva, see Durva, if I wanted a rose, I would have planted a rose. If I wanted more jasmine, I would have planted more jasmine. But I planted you because I want Durva. If the Lord wanted, you know, somebody comes and says, I want to be like you or I want to be like Sachin Tendulkar. If the Lord wanted another Sachin Tendulkar, he would have created one more Sachin Tendulkar. He didn't do that because he wanted you. Each one of us is here because he wanted us. That is the thing that is often said about coming to Prashantinilyam. Each one of us is in Prashantinilyam because the Lord wants us. But if we look at it even with the broader thing, each one of us is on this earth because the Lord wanted us. He wanted us. Is that not enough purpose? Why do we get into these ephemeral and superficial surface level comparisons? Because of this disconnect between theory and practice. And this disconnect between theory and practice comes because of lack of faith. Simple as that. We don't have faith in what we have heard from Swami. We don't have faith in what we speak about. We may speak about the things what Swami has said, but I don't have faith in that. I'm just speaking about it. That's it. And because of that, guess what? We are, we are not full-time devotees. We are only part-time devotees. Speaking of full-time and part-time devotees, I'm reminded of what <clears throat> Professor Bhagya from the MBA department He narrated a conversation he had with Bhagwan on the portico. 
Swami came to him and asked him, in the company you were working, how many types of workers were there? He said, Swami, we had two types of workers. What are they? Swami, part-time workers and full-time workers. Uh, what, what does part-time worker get? Swami, part-time worker gets his wages, daily wages. Whatever work he has done, proportionate to that, he gets his income. Then what about full-time worker? Doesn't he get? No, Swami, he gets his wages. But apart from that, Swami, he also gets DA, DNS allowance. And Swami, he also gets, apart from that, he gets, uh, there's a fund which will give him pension after retirement. So that once he's, his job is over, because of the job that has been done, he will continue to be supported. Swami said, like that only, I have part-time devotees and full-time devotees. Part-time devotees get daily wages. They will get there, whatever they have done, they get. Full-time devotees get daily wages and they get dearness, dearness allowance. They are allowed to become dear to me. And I also give them pension, not only this birth. After they finish their birth, for future also, once they have given up this birth also, it will keep helping them. They will get regular doses. And Bhagya sir said, Swami, all are part-time devotees. Swami said, yeah, that is the problem. Then he said, Swami, part-time devotion only takes so much time, Swami. How will I do full-time devotion? You know, I, Because he sincerely, Bhagya sir, amazing. He's such an inspiring personality. And really, I felt if Bhagya sir is part-time devotee, then <laughs> I won't get daily wages also. I'm a, God knows, contract worker, labor, something like that. But he said, it's because... I know whenever sir teaches also, he is oozing Swami and every time he is oozing Swami. So he actually asked this to Swami, very genuinely. Swami, part-time devotion ke liye time nahi hai. We don't have time for part-time devotion. How will we find time for full-time devotion? Because now I don't have the time to narrate that, but Bhagya sir had a beautiful experience where Swami told him, don't think spirituality means just stopping all your work and sitting and meditating. That's rubbish. That's not spirituality. So, you have said that, Swami, and now you are telling full-time devotion. Now, what is it? You know, where is the... Swami said, actually, full-time devotion is easier. It's less time-consuming than part-time devotion. And then Swami said, what is full-time devotion? Swami said, full-time devotion means, irrespective of what happens, you don't get excited, nor will you get depressed. You just accept everything that happens as Swami's prasad. That is full-time devotion. Equanimity. You know, it's so beautiful. Every, you know, that's what it is so beautiful. As we go deeper into any one aspect of Swami, it comes back to the same thing. Sukha dukke same kritva labha labhau jaya jayau. Being equanimous in the face of profit and loss, victory and defeat, joy and sorrow. Why you are equanimous? Because you feel this is what the Lord is giving me. This is the Lord's prasadam. You know, in a temple, when they are giving prasadam, you won't say, hey, kharabat, give me, give me laddu. We don't do that. Whatever that priest, you know, I used to wonder that. I will not go and eat any leaf. But in a temple, he gives a leaf, no, I won't even think. I just do that and eat it off. Anything that he gives. In fact, on Ugadi, they make one special pachadi with neem. Oh my God. You don't want to go anywhere near it. But on that day, you will apply it like this and pray like that and eat it and ensure one drop also doesn't go. See, that is the difference that comes when there is a feeling of prasad. When you feel that this is what the Lord is giving me, you forget all your personal tastes and you just take, swallow whatever is given. Because there has been a case where somebody brought a prasad and it got spoiled, that vada had got spoiled. But I ate it. I never said, hey, this is spoiled vada. No, no. I just felt nothing can happen. Because this is God's prasad. Nothing can happen. Nothing happened to me. I don't know the signs and all behind it. But nothing happened. I ate that spoiled vada. Because it's prasad. And I just feel that possibly as, just like nothing happened to me when I ate that spoiled vada, spoiled in the worldly sense, I feel any experience that is considered as spoiled or bad in a worldly sense will not do anything to me as long as I take it as prasad from God. And Swami said, that is what defines you as a full-time devotee. And I feel, 
since there is only one purpose in life the best way to achieve that purpose in life is to become a full time devotee and if we are immersed in that quest of becoming a full time devotee we will not have time to see and compare and think whether somebody's life is more purposeful somebody's is not no we'll be so busy in making our own lives purposeful because there's only soul there's only one purpose to life and possibly on a concluding note you know i feel all of us are like rocks that are being sculpted into idols of god today morning's discourse again swami was saying as long as you search for god outside you will never find peace let's be honest yeah we saw god in swami we followed him we pursued him we ran behind him we loved interacting with him we have done it for one hour for one day for one year for 10 years have we found peace apart from the occasional spurts of peace and joy and those occasional spurts you know swami would say is not devotion it's emotion and we cry out and swami just one intense burst next moment it's over we have not found because even swami will not change the truth that you you can find god outside you have to find within and therefore swami would say i remember on one occasion when a student gave an example saying that the lord is chiseling each one to be god he is like the sculptor who is chiseling a rock to make it god swami corrected him saying i am not making rock into god god is already there the idol already exists in the rock i only chip away those parts which are not the rock which are not the idol when i chip away all that is not krishna krishna comes i am not creating krishna in a rock krishna is already there in the rock so to swami would say that there is already divinity within each one of you i am just chipping away those parts which are not divinity that's our ignorance that is our vices that is our whatever our false sense of body identification mind identification ego and when you chip it you know the rock gets hurt it gets hit so too when the lord chips away at our body attachment we get hurt that's because we are identifying ourselves with the rock and not the idol because when i identify with the idol i know that nothing of me is getting lost all that is not me is only being chipped off we have to offer ourselves to the lord that way and in the meanwhile you know when the chipping is going on you see sometimes how they chip at 20 30 40 blows they have to hit then it breaks so i am receiving my 10th blow and somebody else is receiving the 40th blow and the chip falls and i feel it that is more purposeful life see chipped away i am still useless hey don't don't you are in the 10th blow now tell me out of the 40 blows needed to chip that rock which is the most purposeful chip which is the most useful hit all are equally useful in the same way in our lives also there no need to compare because each is in a different stage and that's not for us to worry let us realize that all are in the same pursuit all lives are equally purposeful because the ultimate purpose is that it doesn't matter how rich somebody becomes how powerful somebody becomes like alexander because that's what happened right yeah and it and how purposeful our life is doesn't depend on how history remembers us everybody feels alexander's life is purposeful what is the use if he himself didn't feel it's purposeful and there are some lives which are undiscovered am- amidst us they may possibly never come to light at all does it make their life unpurposeful no so doesn't matter on what others think doesn't matter on you know what matters is we know the purpose of life and i think once we know the purpose of life we are all equal we are all equal because we are all in the same purpose so this inequality will come as long as there is someone who knows the purpose and someone who doesn't know the purpose and in knowing the purpose of life i think we can make a beginning with knowing it at least theoretically and then start trying to bring it into our own practice and for that yes we have we are so lucky that swami has be left behind in a physical way i'm saying such a fund of knowledge such a fund of such a treasure of trove of knowledge just sit five of us let us sit and listen to a discourse each one of us gets a different meaning from it depending on our own level of need and our own level of evolution 
it's there waiting for us but we don't spend time and energy in that because we are trying to find our purpose elsewhere but as swami would say running in the world is like running a race at the end of the race you will realize you are back to where you began from you will never you will never uh, find fulfillment in that it's a big zero you run fully and completed and you realize you have made a zero there is only one hero and the moment we dedicate our life in that pursuit i think we are all equal in making our lives purposeful thanking swami for this beautiful opportunity to share the thoughts that he inspired jai sairam